So to um, give you a little bit of background, I've been doing homelessness or research with people experiencing homelessness for about a decade. Um, before my PhD in, in London, during my PhD in Paris for two years from an anthropological ethnographic perspective always. And recently during COVID, and this is what this work um, with Ina Meng is based on, who can't be here with us tonight. She's actually based in, in Boston um, these days. We conducted research um, during the first pandemic um, lockdown measures. So from March to about June last year in Cambridge. So this is a very specific time period, um, which is important to keep in mind um, for everything that I'm going to say. This is not very, very recent, where I think things were slightly more figured out, but early when the pandemic had just hit. Um, and what I want to talk about today is very particularly people who are both um, directly coming from the streets, often into what um, has since been called COVID hotels, so emergency housing paid for by central government funds um, to house people that are experiencing homelessness during the lockdowns until now, actually, the Cambridge quote unquote COVID hotel is still open and it's supposed to be closing this month. Um, and particularly um, people with that background that are also struggling with mental health and, and addiction issues. So just to um, give you that context, very important to keep in mind. Just to repeat, um, this is research based um, in a very specific university town in the UK, in Cambridge, which is um, overall a very rich place and um, has a very, very sophisticated research or network um, of service provisions for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and this research, again, was conducted between about March and July last year, so really during the first lockdown. Um, and what we did is conduct both participant observation in different homeless um, service provisions from a kind of homeless emergency shelter that also functioned a little bit like a day center to people um, that were carrying out outreach um, and doing different interviews with stakeholder stakeholders, including quite a few people experiencing homelessness that were in different COVID hotels. This research has since carried on, um, but the kind of observations that we've made, say, between the summer and now are not going to be what we're presenting on today. And the, the key takeaways, I think, which I'm going to go into detail in a second, uh, it was a massive experiment um, of unconditional housing, not exactly housing first, because housing first usually comes with um, one of the ideas that it's housing that you can stay in forever. This is obviously not um, the case here, but there was no such thing um, imposed on people like um, welfare readiness, right? There were no checks about who this housing is being offered to. As soon as you were identified, usually by street outreach as somebody who's experiencing homelessness, you were offered free housing, no questions asked, which um, very much worked out. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. The second and, and the unfortunate thing is um, the most marginalized people, so the people that were struggling both with what is often called dual diagnosis, so um, drug addiction issues as well as mental health, and they often go hand in hand um, anyway, fell through the safety net because, um, and again, um, keep in mind, this is a first lockdown, um, there were no specific rules in place to keep institutions open that were particularly helping people with these issues to um, support them. And a lot of the services, um, again, particularly around addiction and mental health, actually shut down temporarily, particularly during the first lockdown, which let the um, housing providers completely hanging up in the air because they didn't have trained staff that could help with that. So they were, in a sense, feeling as if they were forced to, quote unquote, let these people go slash evict them. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a, in a moment. And what we're also seeing is that um, the shift to digital care, which has happened um, subsequently, and I think um, we're going to see an uptake of that going forward as we are in um, any other part of the population with healthcare, was rocky at first, particularly during this first lockdown, where some of the addiction support services shifted online, but most of the people experiencing homelessness that were supposed to engage with them and did engage with them in person didn't want to do that. So let me get into a little bit more detail and I'll focus on the second bit because I think that's the, the most interesting bit. So as I said already, um, 
this provision of, of housing paid for by the central government in the UK um, very much was a massive experiment um, that resembled what you could call housing first. Um, it was unconditional. Um, you were um, provided with both housing and support that came in different facets and, and shades, and some of it was better than others. There were quite weird things happening around um, security or people that were hired to actually provide security in some of these COVID hotels ending up doing quasi support, which one can get into more detail of as well. But overall, I think both the people that were moving into these um, quote unquote housing fast hotels in the first lockdown and the people providing the professional and unprofessional support were very happy and um, surprisingly um, content with how this all went. Um, in, and again, I'm talking about a very specific setup here in Cambridge, obviously. There was no such thing as welfare checks um, done before them moving in. On the contrary, lots of people actually were helped to get into the benefit system, to be linked up to um, particular types of um, non-mental, non-addiction support healthcare that they needed, to ultimately then moving into longer term housing. So that was a very, very big success to a point where the numbers are not exactly exact necessarily, but about 120 people were offered housing in the beginning and all of them have since been emergency housing, have since moved on to longer term housing, which is a massive success. Um, the question here being, is this housing provision, also the longer term bits actually going to work out for the next year or two or three, and that will depend heavily on how much support these people will be offered. But the most important point, what I want to dwell on a little bit more today is, um, who fell through these quote unquote cracks of what at first and from one level looks like a very, very well done and again, surprisingly um, well done system of, of housing and support during the first lockdown. And the unfortunate answer is um, people with the most pressing and most complex needs. And the simple reason from talking to the different stakeholders is there isn't enough support in what is often an atomized system in particular pockets right? Because the idea is that your housing provision happens in one place, some kind of general support with, for instance, benefits or linking you up to certain, um, say, job seekers agencies is linked to that. And there will be reasonably general support workers in person there where you're being provided housing. But all of the other more specialized support, obviously, including healthcare is quote unquote outsourced. So the idea is that under normal circumstances, you have a specific person that only helps you with addiction. You have another person, and that's where it gets a bit weird already, that is helping you with mental health. One or the other will be able to, or, or your GP will be able to get you your method. And if this is something that you need, having come out of an opioid addiction. Um, and lots of that will be different agencies that don't necessarily communicate with each other, making this, particularly in a situation where people don't really have any guidance from government, which unfortunately was the case during the first lockdown, um, lots of this broke down. All the networks and obviously people weren't supposed to go out anymore. None of the in-person support specifically around addiction and mental health was offered for a period of time. That left the housing providers um, in a situation where they didn't have the necessary more complex need support in-house. It was complicated to link up to the slowly reopening and then often digitally offered complex need support because the people didn't want to quote unquote engage in that. Um, and that left, to, left them in, in situations where many of the people experiencing homelessness, again, faced with situations where their mental health deteriorated because suddenly they weren't allowed to go out anymore which pushed many um, into a situation where they wanted to take more drugs. So they were breaking rules in order to go outside to make money, procure the drugs, all of this stretching um, the idea that you weren't supposed to leave the house, which in the end led to a vicious circle of um, quite a few of those people most badly off, partly because of the um, pandemic as such, partly because of the rules that were imposed by the pandemic, and even more so, because the support wasn't in place, being evicted, right? And, and, and that is where I think we need to ask questions around, is this network of atomized support really working going forward? Is this a problem that people are going to deal with also beyond the situation of COVID and lockdowns? 
or um, was this just an emergency where people weren't able, or where people were falling through the cracks slash the service providers weren't able to help properly? My answer would be, and, and something that people are working on, um, and we were involved in, in a little bit of that, um, you need to insource some of this again. So one of the provision, the service providers that I work with and Ina work with, um, they now hired somebody who's specifically only in their institution and their network of institutions anyway, dealing with mental health. Um, but that still leaves a whole block of addiction unsettled, which I think um, for anyone who knows the homelessness um, context a little bit is one of the most prevalent and pressing problems that particularly in the UK is not that well, very well overall. And I'll keep it at that um, for now. Thank you so much for, for pushing me in here and, and being patient with me. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, it was a very nice presentation. And so let's move on to Marketa's presentation. Please, Marketa. Hi, thank you. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'll just read my paper. Um, and... Uh, again, just for the context, uh, my work is with the uh, Roma migrants in Leeds in Northern England. Um, and um, well, I'll just get straight to it. Um, I focus on religion and on sort of access to state care or the limit, limited access to state care and how religion kind of fills this space where uh, state care is absent. Um, and in this paper, I will like talk about... Um, Roma and religious meetings during lockdown. Uh, so to give you a bit of context, I'll talk a bit about the church that I, um, I was working with. So in the last two decades, um, evangelical and charismatic churches have become increasingly popular among Roma across Europe. The church to which my Roma interlocutors belong to is called the Life and Light Church. It was established in the 1950s in France by a French pastor, and since then, the church has become a large transnational Roma-led organization. So I first became aware of the Life and Light Church in 2013 during the field work I did for my PhD, uh, when one of my key informants, whom I call Pavel, converted to the church. Uh, this paper is based in, on like some data or some insights from my research I did for the PhD and from on conversations that I had with some of the some of my informants during the last year, during the last summer and autumn. Uh, so after Pavel converted in 2013, soon after his wife Iveta also converted to the church, and within the next couple of months, their children, who were in their mid to late teens at the time, converted to, and the children's partners as well. Uh, the whole family became active church members, and I started attending the Sunday service, all the prayer meetings, Bible reading sessions, and some large Christian conferences with them. Uh, so to tell you a bit more about the church, uh, Life and Light is a Bible-based church, and among its central tenets is the notion that Jesus rose from the cross and is alive. Uh, Jesus is perceived as a caring figure. And through practices such as individual and collective prayer, the converts establish and reaffirm a sense of having a personal relationship with Jesus as someone who cares for them. Uh, the church also uses the narrative of Roma being a lost tribe from what is now Israel. And through this narrative, they establish a direct collective link to Jesus. Um, the church expects converts to adhere to specific moral expectations. Uh, and to refrain from practices that tend to lead to social conflict, like drinking alcohol, smoking, having extramarital affairs. Um, also, the church expects the converts to refrain from focusing too much on material wealth, and it preaches forgiveness of past transgressions and of perceived wrongdoings. Um, so now I will talk about a bit more about the wider context in which the church gained popularity. Um, Roma in Europe have historically experienced economic and political marginalization. Um, across Europe, Roma have lower life expectancy. They have higher incidences of long-term health issues than non-Roma in the same country. Um, so the various nation states and their bureaucratic processes together with the reproduction of specific forms of knowledge create conditions that shape the marginalization of Roma. 
Roma identity is stigmatized and associated with mostly negative stereotypes and some forms of state care, such as welfare or education, often stigmatize Roma further. Um, so in my research, I suggest that the Life and Light Church provides multiple forms of care to its converts. Uh, Anne-Marie Moll, in her book, talks about care as encompassing activities done to make daily life more bearable. The Life and Light Church and its teachings, with the emphasis on calmness or inner peace, forgiveness uh, and forgiveness, alters the way converts conduct their social relations. The church uses the narrative of Roma being descendants of a lost tribe from Israel as collective and collective worship to create a sense of collectivity. It provides material financial support to both converts and potential converts. So these practices all form um, are all forms tangible of tangible and intangible care. Um, so when the COVID pandemic started, COVID-19 pandemic started last year, and many people moved to working from home the so-called low-skilled workers in the UK who worked in jobs like food packing or as cleaners, which are jobs that Roma often do. So these people continue to go to work. Thus, they had having higher risk of being exposed to the virus. Um, so many Roma in the congregation had to continue to work, continue to go to work um, throughout the pandemic. And those who used to work in the informal economy, like in car washes and other cash in hand jobs, lost their source of income and were often unable to access welfare benefits. When the first UK lockdown started in March 2020, the church's Sunday services stopped because the community hall where they used to be held was unavailable. And the prayer and Bible study meetings also stopped for a period of time. With the relaxation of measures from May 2020 onwards, the congregation started to meet again, and they have been meeting throughout the subsequent lockdowns, with services being held outside in the summer and in the homes of converts in the winter. And the pastors also use social media to uh, live broadcast some of the services online. Uh, so in general, uh, people in the congregation complied with the lockdown rules as far as they were aware of them, but made an exception for religious meetings. These were perceived as different to general socializing. And I will now talk a bit more about this. Uh, so during the summer of 2020, when the COVID-19 measures were somewhat relaxed in the UK, I met with Iveta and Pavel. And I also keep regularly in touch with Iveta via online chats. Um, on one occasion, when I was visiting Iveta and Pavel in early September 2020, when the number of COVID-19 cases in the UK was increasing again, and there were restrictions of meeting, pe meeting people indoors, Pavel, who had become a pastor two years after converting, was getting ready to go to a prayer meeting in another convert's house. So these prayer meetings or Bible reading meetings usually involve at least 10 or 15 people, often more, who are together in the living room of one of the converts, where they spend a couple of hours reading from the Bible, they discuss Bible texts, or they pray together. Um, these meetings therefore create situations where a number of people from different household meets without face masks, people are sitting or, sitting or standing around the room facing towards each other, multiple people joining the conversation, they talk aloud, sometimes they sing religious songs, so according to the health advice or to what we know about the spread of COVID-19, these situations uh, pose an increased risk of tran transmission of the virus. Um, as Pavel was getting ready to go to the meeting, I inquired if Iveta was also attending. And Pavel answered that she was not attending because of COVID and that Iveta, who has a number of long-term medical conditions, has to be more careful. Pavel explained that because of Iveta's poor health, she should not be going to places where she would come into contact with people, with other people, and where she, there was a high risk that she could get infected. But he also said that he had to go because it is his duty as a pastor. Um, as Iveta is not the only person among the converts with ongoing and serious medical issues in the congregation, there are several other people with ongoing medical issues or with disabilities and also religious healing and praying for those who are ill is a regular aspect of the church's services. Um, 
and the pastors were obviously aware that there was a higher, or at least some of the pastors were obviously aware uh, that there is a higher risk of transmission of the virus in these settings. It raises the question that why have the church members continued to meet? Um, I have suggested before that the Life and Light Church provides various forms of care to its members by making daily life more bearable. So participating in the meetings throughout the pandemic was a form of care, even though it was transgressing state-created rules, which are a part of biomedical care structures. The restrictions aimed to limit the spread of COVID-19 were built around specific understandings of disease, how it spreads from person to person. Uh, they are a form of biopolitical care based on biomedical understandings of how disease works and these understandings are produced through hegemonic forms of knowledge that trauma do not necessarily uh, hold as valid or perceive as kind of applying to them as, as their own. Uh, biomedical knowledge and practice, even though it is concerned with treatment of diseases and with prolonging individual lives, it is part of structures that cause suffering and precarity. Um, as I already mentioned, the state creates policies that contribute to Roma marginalization and even the structures that exist or the systems that exist to reduce suffering contribute to the long-term suffering of some. Um, for example, in case of Roma, there has been for there has been historical history of forced sterilization of Roma women and uh, access to welfare and education are often used to further stigmatize Roma. So Hyde and Willis state that, quote, care and caretaking encompass both the ability to harm on the one hand and to nurture and empower on the other hand, unquote. This holds true not only for the care practices that exist as part of the state structure, but also for the care practices provided by the church. There is the tension in the church, church's care practices. On the one hand, they have the potential of creating a sense of belonging, changing behavior, and providing material support to converts. On the other hand, they have the potential of contributing to social ills by potentially spreading the virus to others and causing harm to the converts, and also by the spread of conspiracy th theories among church members, which are also harmful. Uh, and I'll leave it at this. It's a work in progress. It's, like I said, it's based on my PhD research, and I'm hoping to develop a future research project based on some of the issues that I discussed here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marketa, for your very engaging presentation. And thanks for sharing with us. Uh, so let's move on to uh, Sultana's uh, presentation, and then we will have Emily, and then we will have discussion. Um, Sultana, yes. so the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, so I start sharing my screen because I have a presentation. So, so does it work? Okay, now you should yes. see everything, right? Okay, so um, hello to everybody, who, um, to all the participants uh, who made it uh, today to the panel. My name is Svetlana Torno. I am a research associate at Heidelberg University. I recently defended uh, my uh, dissertation, uh, which focused on women's life courses and care, and more particularly how care uh, organizes uh, life courses and uh, also how people navigate their life course transitions with regards to care. And uh, the presentation uh, today is based, uh, draws from a case study from uh, my thesis, and it examines the practice of arranged marriages in Tajikistan and traces the violent effects it can bring about in uh, young women's lives. And uh, to give a little bit of context, uh, arranged marriages uh, are quite a common practice in Tajikistan and are usually presented as desirable uh, by parents and children. So from the normative perspective, uh, arranged marriages constitute a part of parental care obligations and include the choice of marriage partner, financing the uh, wedding, uh, and taking over all the wedding costs, and also assisting in uh, uh, establishing an own household uh, for the children. 
Uh, and children on their part are expected to respect their parents and obey their wishes. And uh, without diving too deep into the discrepancies between uh, uh, normative rules and uh, real type, uh, real life practices, um, I would just like to mention here or say that uh, children's opinions are incorporated uh, to varying degrees uh, into uh, partner choice. Um, but it is not always the case, um, as uh, it can sometimes um, have um, negative or very violent and ambivalent uh, outcomes, as you will see uh, during the presentation and um, uh, in, in, in line of, in, um, during this presentation, I will show how a rather random transgression of rules leads to an undesirable marriage of a young woman. Um, and um, how this uh, young lady finds out more or less carefully uh, the way out of this marriage by uh, uh, transgressing uh, rules herself and also accepting violence. Okay, just a short note on uh, Tajikistan. It is a, 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 a mountainous uh, country in the Central Asia, which you see on the map, and the red dot uh, in the southern part of um, Tajikistan uh, specifies the city of Klob, where I did my research. I spent uh, in total 14 months uh, in Tajikistan, and the longest period of stay was uh, in field work was between November 2013 and um, uh, September 2014. And this is also when I met uh, the protagonist of my case study. So on this slide, you see Adiba. Uh, she was 20 years of age and the university student in her second year uh, when I met her in December 2013. She lived in the student dorm, worked part-time, and was very active in many student networks. So she was quite ambitious. She was uh, also dating a young man from Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan. She dreamt of a career, life in a city, and becoming a second wife. Uh, by that, also uh, avoiding to serve uh, parents-in-law um, as, um, as a daughter-in-law. And given uh, Adiba's ambitions, um, I was quite surprised when in uh, January 2014, uh, she was married off very unexpectedly. And back then, her phone remained disconnected for several weeks. Uh, and uh, at some point uh, in February 2013, she called me and arranged a meeting with me in the city center of uh, Kulob. And during this meeting, she revealed that she's going to file for a divorce. And um, how she explained what happened is that uh, shortly um, after the wedding, she refused uh, to have sexual intercourse with her husband for several days, who at some point tried to enforce copulation, knocked her unconscious, and um, called her elder brother to pick her up and bring her back home. And uh, while explaining the circumstances uh, of uh, her wedding, uh, Adiba um, explained to me that uh, she called her uh, husband a stupid person with whom she wouldn't be able to have a single, in in uh, a single, single interesting conversation. Uh, she also, in addition, uh, shortly before the marriage, found out that her husband has been married before and had a child uh, with her for a first uh, wife, which deemed him as uh, an unsuitable marriage partner for a young lady who is, uh, hasn't been married before. So to sum up, uh, Adiba did not want uh, to marry the person chosen by uh, her family, uh, but accepted uh, the decision uh, at the beginning. And in the following, I will example the role of uh, rules transgressions in Adiba's trajectory uh, into and out of this marriage. Um, so there are two types of uh, rules transgression in Adiba's uh, marriage uh, trajectory, and they also relate differently to care. So the first uh, type of rules transgression is a haphazard transgression of rules, which initiated a chain of care, pra of care practices by Adiba's family. So, uh, and this uh, came about um, 
by uh, dismissal of uh, established engagement rules uh, by the group side. So usually in Tajikistan, the marriage negotiations takes several steps. There is uh, at the beginning a rather informal uh, inquiry about the availability of the bride and the willingness of the family uh, uh, to, to give a daughter and to, to uh, engage in this uh, alliance. And then there is a in, then there is a formal um, uh, engagement um, 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 sorry marriage proposal and uh, in the second step in the third step uh, there is um, uh, official engagement ceremony which takes place which is called Futiha and uh, what happened in this case is that the groom side just dismissed uh, the first two uh, uh, ritual steps. Uh, in this uh, in the sequence, and came to Adiba's uh, house uh, with the presents and a sum of money, which usually happens uh, during um, um, the engagement uh, ceremony. Upon that, uh, Adiba's family uh, got very confused and assumed that uh, Adiba and uh, the groom um, had a relationship and going potentially. Uh, sexual in nature, so they were a little bit in the dark and uh, uh, assuming things and um, uh, concerned about Adiba's chastity and also the reputation of the family. They gave an immediate positive response without uh, consulting Adiba uh, on the matter, thus making their care practice highly uh, critical and um, questionable. The second type of uh, rules transgression. Uh, involves uh, deliberate transgression of rules by Adiba herself as a form of self -care. So uh, just a, a small step back, uh, when I asked Adiba why she actually uh, did not protest um, uh, about the marriage decision of her parents before, uh, after she learned that um, that her husband has been married already once before, she explained to me that suspending an official uh, engagement would be harmful for the reputation of the bride and her family because the people would question the bride's virginity. So um, instead of that, or in, in, in line of this, in those um, considerations, Adiba decided to comply uh, to her family decision, also doing it publicly, uh, and also by that safeguarding uh, care and assistance from her, from her family in the future. And she decided to resolve the situation um, after the wedding proper, possibly by presupposing some form of abuse, if not physical, as it happened, then probably verbal. So, and so far, uh, the story, how I recall it, um, depicts uh, the side of Adiba and how she chose to present herself in front of me. But there is also some speculation uh, possible in this. Um, case study. And uh, when, for example, my research assistant learned um, uh, about Adiba's story, he right away assumed that she was uh, not a virgin um, at the time of her wedding. He, and, and this is why her husband uh, became angry and uh, bet her up and uh, divorced her. And uh, at another point uh, during my uh, field work, I also overheard the conversation of Adiba with another student where she mentioned that uh, she uh, spent the night with her boyfriend in a hotel in Kulop before the wedding, thus making it also possible that uh, both of them had um, uh, sexual relations before the wedding. And while it is not uh, possible uh, to know what exactly happened before or after the wedding, um, we can conclude that uh, the final outcome is that Adiba's behavior caused the dissolution of an undesirable marriage. And as a divorced woman, she gained more freedoms to shape her into her own ideas. So, and then let me briefly come to the conclusions. So, recent care research has problematized an overall positive image of care in different contexts. Um, and we saw also and listened to many. Uh, 
examples during uh, our panel today as well. And Adiba's trajectory documents a similar um, uh, ambivalent form of care in the context of intergenerational relations. The case study illustrates how societal norms, intergenerational responsibilities, and accidental transgression of matrimonial rules intermingle and press a family to rather hastily accept a marriage proposal. And from Adiba's perspective, faced with an undesirable marriage, she decided to transgress behavioral norms as a form of self-care, which she did by refusing matrimonial intercourse or, as speculated by my research assistant, engaging in sexual relations with her boyfriend before the wedding. So I thank you for your attention. Come to Thanks, a lot. Thanks a lot, Sultana, for your uh, interesting and structured presentation. Uh, so uh, Emily is our last presenter today. Uh, Emily, screen is yours. Thank you, um, and hello, everyone. Um, just hold on one moment while I share. Great, um, so let me know if you can't hear me um, or if you can't see the images. Um, but thank you so much for having me, um, Ahmad and Leticia um, and Tatiana for, uh, for responding to these papers in advance and to the, the fellow panelists. Um, it's, it's lovely to be gathered with you. Um, here today, albeit digitally. Um, so my name is Emily Glazer. Um, I'm based at UCL. Uh, my research is funded by the Wellcome Trust. Um, and my research explores water infrastructure, care and environmental justice in Jerusalem in this broader context of the Anthropocene, but I'll be focusing on just one or a couple of elements within that much broader uh, framing um, today. Um, I'll be sharing an abridged version of the text that I shared. Um, and some pictures to accompany it, just to bring it to life. So if you need a break from the screen after so long on a Saturday, then feel free to look away and move around and listen. Um, so as a bit of context, um, in this wider region that Jerusalem sits within, water plays a central role in politics. Um, it has underpinned decisions for war. Uh, it's intertwined with the occupation, so it's aligned with the snaking and the location of the, um, the security wall. It's a tool of control and it's being used as a non-lethal deterrent in protests all around um, uh, the, the, the setting. Um, but amidst this all, Israel prides itself on being at the forefront of water technology. Um, so desalination systems are exported to China, to California and to India. Um, and delegations from around the world um, tour the Gihon, which is the water utility of Jerusalem, and which prides itself on its innovations um, and on having the best quality of water in the country. And so water quality is the focus of what I'm sharing with you today um, as a focal point where care and slow violence intertwine in Jerusalem, where even though water is not a dominant matter of concern, its infrastructure and the care transgressions that take place within it um, are a strand of the slow and invisible forms of violence, um, which are part of the wider story of the material politics um, of Jerusalem and how they manifest themselves in daily life here. Um, so water quality emerged in my doctoral research, which took me um, across the city to the water quality labs of the Gihon, uh, the community centers and um, homes in East Jerusalem, uh, to municipal forums and to farms in the region and slightly more widely where water from the city is sold and where it flows to. And I'm, I'm in Jerusalem at the moment. I have a couple of months of my research left. So all of this is still very much sort of present and live and I'm thinking through it um, as it's uh, taking place. So I'll start in Silwan, um, which is a neighborhood which flanks the old city um, of Jerusalem. Um, and it's the site of an important spring. Um, it's also one of the neighborhoods which faces forced displacement and demolition of homes, which is much like Sheikh Jarrah been in the news um, over recent weeks. Um, and in January 2019, um, I was meeting with Samira as a check-in for my research um, that I had been doing with a small group of women around um, the neighborhood of Siluan to learn about their stories and their relations with the sites of water in this neighborhood. And Samira explained to me why, to her mind, water is not interesting. She said, water is something that we can't control. Um, it has become industrial. The water is delivered to the homes, the women pay the bills or they pay the fines, and that's it. Water is a burden now. 
Um, so this, this sort of this comment struck me because the relations with water in Jerusalem were not always this way, and this came up um, very distinctly in the the conversations that I'd been having with Um Atif, Um Ali, and Um Abed, the three women who had guided me around the neighborhood. Where when they speak of the water, they speak with love and joy as they emo- evoke memories of of these places. Um, of water in the village. So where, for example, there would be intergenerational gatherings across families. They were spaces of play and pleasure because of the nature. This is where they would gather to collect water to drink um, in a kind of social um, community. Um, And the water itself would be used to wash clothes and and to um, water the fruit trees and agriculture um, that this uh, small village was known for, particularly the figs and the chard. Um, which were especially rich in flavour because of the water, because of the special quality um, that came from the minerals um, of the spring. Um, I was also told about the stories of magic and spirits, uh, where much like all of the springs and places of water in Palestine, um, as documented by uh, an ethnographer in the 1920s called Tofi Kanan, um, spirits animate and they protect the sites of water um, uh, in, in the dynamic with the communities there. Um, so these were relations with water across multiple dimensions that lived on for generations where the community cares for the water and the water cares back for the community in this kind of reciprocity across human and non-human relations. But now the main sites of the spring in Silwan are part of the archaeological tour centre for the city of David. Um, where uh, it's a it's a um, a site backed by right-wing settler organization. Um, and the springs no longer are where the women gather uh, to find water to drink or to clean or to nourish the, the plants or fruit. Um, inside, instead, they have many other sort of primary concerns, um, like the safety of children in the streets, um, the fear of arrest um, for, their, for their children, particularly their sons. Um, the demolition of their homes uh, by Israeli forces and having enough money to pay debts, fines or rent in a city that's expensive and um, in some ways deliberately so um, uh, in in their perspective. Um, So water becomes no longer a matter of concern or of care. Um, And Silwan is important because it's one of the daily contexts of where water infrastructure in the city flows through and where the transgressions that this infrastructure operates are at work um, and contribute to the sense of loss. And so to understand how this happens, we have to move to the pipelines of water, which extend across uh, the city underground, where water is delivered to households, including the households in Siluan. So the Gijon uh, was established in 1996, and it takes over from municipal services then to provide water um, across the city. Um, With meticulous detail, every day a small group of environmental scientists um, and lab technicians conduct an array of chemistry and microbiology tests. Um, to monitor the water. Um, And these daily tasks and the ways in which the water quality scientists understand their work, I think are a form of care, especially in the kind of extended version that Maria Puig uh, de la Bella Casa um, speaks about um, in the places of techno-scientific realms where meanings of care can take on these deep ambivalences and extend across these systems and objects and materials. Um, and this is at the, the, the case of the Gijon where, for example, there is um, dexterity in the, um, the sort of manual and physical labor that's required for the tests that are conducted. The lexicon that's used and the sentiments that are evoked by environmental scientists um, also revolve around a lexicon of care. So prevention, protection, safety and security are words that they use a lot and, and do so with this real sense of uh, duty to support the public health um, of the, the residents of Jerusalem. And all of these practices are governed by the water quality standards and the national water regulations, which are constantly referenced um, and form the backbone of the schedule of tests, the parameters that are used and how those tests are actually performed themselves. Um, And these national water quality regulations and international standards, the rules in this case, define how good water quality is understood at the Gijon. So for example, firstly, it's understood on quantitative terms. Um, When I was speaking with Alain, one of the environmental scientists at the lab, um, asking him what makes good quality water, he said, water that melts from the ice, I have no idea. I know what the rules are, but whether there's a difference between five or 5.5 ppm, I don't know. Uh, They make sense, the rules, but I never checked it totally, the issue. They make sense, so I live with them. 
And then secondly, um, in defining um, water quality by these standards, they become completely divorced from the actual source itself. So information about where water is from is not necessary to complete the lab tests. Um, it's not something that people talk about nor are really concerned about in the Gijon. Um, and it sort of becomes a black box within this um, techno-scientific realm. So there are a number of implications that come from this care for water through standards and through regulations. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them now. Uh, Susan Lee Starr and Jeffrey Broker wrote in 2000 um, about how standards like classifications act as a kind of moral and ethical agenda where each standard and each category valorizes some point of view and silences another. Uh, they're designed and embedded within particular social, political and economic settings. So building on this work at the Gijon, there is a deeper mon uh, moral politics at play where water regulations are embedded in the institutions of the Israeli state. These are the same regulations which outline the role of the Mekahot, um, which is the national water um, carrier, um, where it is tasked in the regulations with um, centralized water provision. The Mekahot draws water from the desalination plants that are all lined uh, along the Mediterranean coast. It draws water from the Lake Kinneret in the north, um, and it draws water from the mountain aquifer, which lies under the West Bank, above which Palestinian farmers are prevented from digging wells, um, and where 80% of Palestinian water is then diverted into this Israeli national water carrier system, uh, which then sells the water to the Gijon, which distributes it across Jerusalem. Um, and this information about source then becomes an entirely negligible data point in the lab. So enacting water regulations through chemistry and microbiology tests does this thing of rendering other relations with water in the city less necessary. For example, the aesthetic and the effective ties with the Jerusalem Springs in Silwan then become subsumed by a centralized system for water quality monitoring, where Palestinian Jerusalemite households are drawn into the infrastructural folds of an occupied city, um, an occupied city where they don't have full rights um, uh, nor political freedom. Um, so care for water quality from the Gijon, which happens in this way through bureaucracy, through standards and through this large scale infrastructure, becomes the dominant modality of caring for water in Jerusalem. Care is relocated to taps and to labs, away from neighborhood springs, um, wells and away from the practices and imaginations that were maintained over generations. So care for water here then becomes less about community and less about the interpersonal and embodied relations to being entangled with the state project governed by power, by control, and also by surveillance. Um, so there are other transgressions which take place across the water system in Jerusalem. And um, I will just end with one of those, um, which draws attention back um, to the home. So not all households in Silwan are um, uh, are paying water to the Gijon and are, um, are part of the Gijon set of customers. Um, because in order to be connected to the Gijon, um, construction for a house or the household itself must have received a building permit um, and widespread discrimination takes place in the allocation of building permits in Jerusalem, which means that Palestinian homes are often forced to be built outside of regulations. So in these cases, the infrastructural connections are pirated. Um, people install black tanks, they illegally collect them to the main water pipes um, or to neighbors' pipelines um, to whom they either pay a price or for whom they are provided water in this kind of mutual act of um, support and care. Um, and when these tanks come up in conversations at the Gijon, they're mentioned with disappointment as sort of illegal acts that are taken, taking place um, and as potential health hazards because of the need for constant maintenance of the water on this individual basis and because of how the summer heat could lead to the plastic tank material contaminating the water, um, which could be detrimental for, for health. So on the one hand, these black tanks, which dot the skylines of East Jerusalem, are a manifestation of a kind of transgression of care that goes beyond these infrastructural and legal regulations. But on the other hand, the transgression here is done for and with care, um, where faced with no other choice, the connection with water is forged, uh, on one's own terms and despite any potential health consequences, um, where, where water is ensured to be in the home in a determination to stay in a city where every state regulation or many state regulations are deliberately designed to maintain a Jewish majority 
uh, and so slowly push out Palestinian residents um, as part of the same legal matrix which settler groups are using to um, forcibly expulse and displace the families in Silwan and in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, so much like care, what counts as a transgression in this case is quite relative. Um, so in writing about care, Hobart and Nice, um, surface accounts of where care is intertwined with and enacts violence, where building on um, black and brown feminist scholars like Audre Lorde and Alondra Nelson, they write also about how care can also hold hope and promise in precarious times. So across the urban water infrastructure of Jerusalem, care takes on a form that is centralized, industrialized, neoliberal, patriarchal, and standardized, as I hope I've outlined a little bit here, um, in the fold of what is a settler colonial project and which many Palestinians have for years also called a state of apartheid. Um, this care imposes itself on other ways of caring with and for water, rendering it no longer a matter of care. Um, and so in so doing, it intervenes within, but it never entirely severs these reciprocal bonds with water from, from the past um, and within these very local villages or neighborhoods of um, Jerusalem. Um, and I think it can be seen as a form of slow and quiet and invisible violence, which takes on forms that is economic, that is material, legal, intimate, bodily and microbiological. Um, the transgressions which take place also hint at alternative infrastructural, political and environmental possibilities um, in the small acts like visiting a pool and dipping one's feet in the water um, or, or connecting one's plumbing to illegal um, lines as part of these wider politics to carve out spaces for Palestinian survival, um, resilience and freedom in Jerusalem. Um, so care here in Jerusalem is also multiple and, and I hope that that can be seen across these different um, settings where it's infrastructural, it spans time and scale and species, um, and these visceral affective experiences um, that uh, take place across the invisible and determined politics of everyday lives um, in Jerusalem. So I will end there. Thank you so, so much for listening, um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So thank you very much, Emily, for your rich presentation and your exciting topic. Uh, I wish you best of luck with the rest of your field work. Uh, so as we did in the in the first session, we will move on to um, and ask uh, Tatiana to kindly share her comments with us. And then we will ask uh, speakers to answer and respond to the comments. And then we will uh, go back to Tatiana for uh, the uh, concluding remarks. Um, please, Tatiana. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Actually, I plan to do them both together. Oh, uh, that, that, that will be good. I mean, that will be, I, yeah. You asked me not to talk more than five minutes, so uh, so I, I will do that together. So I start with some Thanks. individual remarks and questions on each paper, and then I and and uh, like in the first session, I also try to draw on what kinds of transgressions and, and care are we talking about, and then you know conclude. Okay, so um, having said this, thank you also for uh, in this session for your for sharing your uh, very interesting and wonderful papers. Um, I go uh, in the same order as they were presented. So starting with uh, Johannes and the uh, drugs uh, harm reduction um, during the first uh, part of um, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, you didn't do this now in your talk, but I read in your paper, I focused more actually on the case you presented there, where the tensions between care as supportive attention and as control figured very prominently again. And uh, as I read it, there were kind of two forms of transgressions, um, one on the side of uh, the management uh, and, and the whole case you started your paper with and which was kind of absent uh, in your paper now was Johnny. Johnny, who was not thrown out of the housing facility. Um, so uh, this was one kind of full transgression from the, from, the, from the side of the management. And then on the other hand, there was himself transgressing the institutional rules and both incidents were not, or, I, that was one of my questions, if they are actually um, connected. Um, but similar to the eating disorders, which we discussed in the, in the first um, session, there was a 
uh, to me, they also um, represented a kind of general struggle if um, about or um, is it about so if uh, or the ambivalent quality of care as uh, life sustaining or not. Um, a connection um, that COVID might have brought to the fore is that the very boundaries between state bureaucratic care for the population, a topic that reoccurs then in Emily's paper, uh, carried out through classifying and then controlling parts of the citizenry on the one hand and the individual discretion of the state actors vis-a-vis uh, -vis specific individualized needs on the other side. Um, and the boundary in this case um, uh, seems to be presented materially and then transgressed also through the concrete inside and outside of this housing facility. Now, this seems in, in light of what I think now you, you presented uh, the other parts of your paper more. So it might be for the listeners a little bit strange that uh, that is how I read your paper. Um, and I tried to do, uh, you have not been present in the first session, but in the in the first session, I also tried to, to draw out of the papers what kind of boundaries, what kind of rules are actually transgressed here. So, uh, and with that, I turned to Marquetta and the prayer meetings. So there seems to be a similar um, tension between the particular care within a group or for an individual and the more general public. So here the pastoral care um, uh, of joy as in the form of joint prayers sits kind of uneasily during the pandemic uh, and the prayer rooms as, as she uh, recalled um, <clears throat> present a similar kind of interface between the public and the private as I uh, see it as the homeless project. So in both cases, the state care rules are transgressed to provide either more personalized or in this case also religious care. Um, I think in addition, this paper shows another very fundamental tension as uh, so in the other, in the in former session, we had this autonomy versus uh, equality ideals. And here, the position of religion. So in, in Western liberal democracies, usually religion is um, confined somehow to the private. It's a personal matter. But if then religious ideals contradict um, this notion, their uh, attention becomes obvious. And this is the tension um, here again, um, or yeah, care again becomes a kind of a boundary marker of this uh, tension of what is perceived to be private and what is perceived um, public. So, so part of the question I, I think here is that tension is that is our tension or is it the tension of the church believers? So the the, the, the tension you you are drawing attention to. Um, coming to uh, Svetlana's uh, paper, there is a, a very interesting case of a young woman who enters an unwanted marriage in order to safeguard her parents and at the same time. Um, her plans for her own life trajectory. Um, Svetlana very carefully, uh, you know, listed the different uh, transgressions. Um, and uh, one of them is the non-obedience to the rules of the side of the carers, who, however, might do so as an act of care. So very ambivalent uh, situation here. And it seems to be a little bit unclear what kind of really happened and how different actors conceive of this marriage. But it seems clear that the main protagonist uh, is able to construct her narrative through alluding to something that are traditional, quote unquote, values of care. In doing so, she also constructs um, herself as a modern individual vis-a-vis -vis the ethnographer, which I think is uh, comes really uh, nicely out uh, in the paper. And, and this last aspect about uh, constructing a, a tale of modernity is also very present in the, uh, in the narratives in Jerusalem, which then also, again, um, inhabits a similar tension of scale between, as, as in the first paper, between caring through infrastructure for the population and individual relations built around 
caring for close ones through water. Uh, so a little bit similar to the paper by Svetlana, the, the tale of modernization provides a narrative structure to convey one's own identity. And the Palestinian women who are, who are very prominent in the, in the written version construct a past of community gatherings around water, kin care through water that then is lost due to new urban infrastructures. So I guess what I'm trying to get at here is to question a little bit this tale, uh, if one really needs to buy into that and, uh, uh, and to, um, to construct this very, um, uh, very um, hard contrast to the water scientists to, to then from their side work through standardization and numbers um, and, and construct this as caring for the population. Um, and this is a kind of, although it was not named as such in the, in the paper, seems to be a kind of a Foucauldian vision of, of governing through infrastructure. And then transgression is found in ignoring a state rule, um, which is, for example, by accessing water outside the legal framework, and uh, which then becomes a little bit similar to the Greek um, activists, a kind of uh, resistance. Um, <clears throat> so so the, the concept of care then is, is something that uh, can, be, um, can be seen as, as a concept of, of critique. And, uh, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's just a, a matter of, so what, what choices do we make? How, do, how we use a, a conceptual framework? And with that, I'm coming then to the general reflections <laughs> very quickly because the, the organizers uh, um, gave us, all of us, the participants, the task to think about care as an act of, of transgression. And, and this term, I think, allows us to highlight such fundamental uh, tensions of care that denotes both the intimate affection as well as control, be it through infrastructure or otherwise. Um, and this tension occurs, I would say, both in private and state care. And this is something if we have more um, case studies that use care as a concept of critique, usually the control factor is based on the, um, on the state side and not so much on the private sides. So, uh, and this is a choice one can make. Um, the transgression here seems specifically suitable to highlight the ambivalence, um, I, I think, and how care marks diverse practices, spaces, relations as either state or non-state, formal, informal, good or bad. Um, so uh, what I try to, to point to some of the already during commenting um, on the individual papers to some of the overarching uh, topics, some of the shared motives and the cultural ideals um, that run through the papers. I think having said this, and there is a specific um, advantage to using um, transgression, there's also kind of a disadvantage or problem um, with this term that also came out in some of the um, papers and uh, already mentioned uh, in the call is that it usually has uh, negative connotations. So, and most of the papers used it this way, it denotes a, a breach of rules. In the call, uh, the organizers um, also called attention to possible positive outcomes of such rule breaching. And we had uh, at least two papers who used it in that kind of political sense and some, sometimes in an in individual sense. Um, but it might be difficult to really loosen that negative uh, connotation um, and, and strong negative associations the term comes with. Um, moreover, I would think that uh, it might also entail the risk of reinforcing some boundaries instead of calling them into question. So if we call an act transgression, this implicitly takes the boundaries for granted. Um, so, th so before there can be transgressed, there must be there. So it might be then um, the, the, the boundary between private public, family and the state, bureaucratic, 
or formal, informal. Um, so all, all these that I have listed um, before already. Um, and as an example, if we have affectionate care between a state carer and a patient, that can only be seen as a transgression if we assume that the boundaries between the public professional life and the private person are already in place. So some, so it might be harder than to, to call them into question. Um, so therefore, all in all, I would suggest that maybe the focus on rules and, and stark contrasts between formal, informal state, non-state, and so forth is not too helpful. Um, because then we get stuck in judging or evaluating if and so how someone has indeed breached a rule and if the outcome indeed has been good or bad. Um, while there might be much more fluidity on all sides. Um, so care does not really follow from rules, neither in private nor in state realms. And I think, I guess possibly we can all agree on that. So that in each case, the expectations and needs need to be negotiated and transformed and thereby also transform what is usually seen as the context or the political order. So coming to an end, I think it might be useful instead to turn the perspective kind of and to explore how the reaction or the sanction of care transgression in fact establishes or produces these realms um, named in the call, formal, informal state, non-state, uh, legal, illegal in the first place, and what is then the outcome. So this is a slight shift I would suggest could be helpful in discussing also um, some of the presented cases. So. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the discussion now. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks for your uh, very helpful comments, and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, it helps all of us to uh, see care as, as a, and like, it, it provides a very helpful framework to think about care, rules, and transgression. So now we, uh, if, if uh, any of the presenters um, um, have any, any comments, so please feel free to share with us. So if any, any of you uh, like the speakers would like to comment, don't feel pressured. <laughs> Um, I can just quickly respond to yes, um, to Tatiana's uh, comments. First of all, thank you so much, Tatiana, for your engagement and um, thoughtful response to um, the paper that I shared. Um, I'm very aware of the dangers of falling into the pitfalls of that kind of binary contrast between large scale infrastructure and the small scale. It's sometimes difficult to avoid when it's that contrast is, is there and present in the field site, but it's there are nuances to it, absolutely. And I think I'm still working through how to write that into um, what will become my thesis and the chapters and papers that emerge from this work. Um, but some of those nuances are that whilst overwhelmingly, for example, um, these women speak with this sort of very warm joy and love and, um, and, and sort of affection to the sites of water, these places are also, or the, the infrastructures itself from the past um, were not always um, associated with those kinds of affective um, relations. So the sewage ran freely from the old city down into Silwan and there were um, deaths and illnesses associated with that. And that has been remedied by the large scale infrastructure that has been introduced by the municipality in the Gijon over the years. Similarly, within the Gijon, um, there are many Palestinian uh, members of staff who work there and the water quality team in some ways was sort of like a small, um, slightly more politically open version of, I think, the rest of the institution where um, uh, conversations were um, very much acknowledging the importance of providing good quality water across the city um, and where there were these very um, kind of felt affective um, senses of care and duty towards the residents who would call and complain about the water um, and 
um, water in those cases would would slowly deviate a little bit away from the quantified version that it becomes within the fold of the standards and yet always sort of veers back to it. Um, and these are nuances that I know I need to sort of write into how I um, speak about um, these very different ways of relating to water, but it's really helpful um, to think through that as, as you were um, sharing it. And I think the story of modernity is also really important um, and I think will be very productive to kind of expand out further when, when writing about um, the relations with infrastructures in, um, uh, in, in Jerusalem um, and how it intertwines with these sort of very technocentric ways of, um, of delivering water infrastructure in this highly sensitive and charged um, political context uh, where there's been much written also about sort of the relations between modernization and settler colonialism. And I think within this context of the 21st century um, in, in this sort of um, very digitally focused uh, city, that will be really interesting to think through. So thank you. Thank you for all of those. Great. Um, so, any questions from the audience? Anything uh, anyone would like to add? Uh, we had one question in the first session. Caroline uh, shared with us one question. So, uh, I was wondering if she's around and she would like to share it with us. Uh, so, it was. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I hope I didn't miss some parts of uh, the first session because there was, like, I'm sure I did miss some parts because there were uh, there were problems of connections. But I, at some point, um, there was concerning a situation in, the, in the, this professor of um, from the UK thing presented this uh, uh, for me as a nurse and anthropologist, um, rather one-sided position on a uh, situation uh, regarding the giving a tower and waiting uh, for that. And it reminded me of a situation that I, I had to live uh, also as a professional. And, um, and um, I experienced that the, the complexity of the situation and uh, how also suffering is uh, uh, like from both sides, the patient and uh, the, the professional is uh, also um, leading to such uh, weird situations sometimes. And um, the, the structure is also difficult to uh, overcome. And, um, and so maybe I missed it in the presentation, but uh, I was wondering if that it's possible in with such topic of uh, research that uh, to, to provide more complexity in the uh, in the situation where uh, um, that we are presenting to to ref to to show these uh, problematics and I, I I would like to know your opinion or your your what you think about that. If possible, thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, so um, I think it was in conversation with uh, Karis uh, that uh, this uh, like professionalization that uh, Simon asked. And, and so, if any one of you would like to answer to this question, it would be great. So I guess the question was like more about like uh, the, uh, the kind of violence that the care receivers inflict upon the caregivers. And that's just something that may be missed from the literature. And, some, uh, and, and this is like, a, uh, like an invitation to reflect upon that. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if you encounter such a um, such a context in your fieldwork, and, and that, that would be helpful to comment on. If not, uh, we would move on uh, to any other questions about like the uh, 
about the uh, presentations or the papers. I, mean, I can think about one instance of Please. this, perhaps in my case, um, which is um, most, it mostly has to do with uh, patients um, being framed as manipulative towards professionals and especially through lies um, by lying to professionals. And um, that is framed as something that creates, generates a lot of frustrations in, in, in healthcare workers. Although it is, um, it is seen as something that is part of the illness. So the fact that patients lie um, is seen as one of the symptoms of, of the illness that sustain the, the eating disorder. So professionals try not to take it personally and kind of are trained not to take it personally. But uh, daily, it is it is really difficult to do that, especially because uh, one of the things that they would stress really often was that differently from most cases um, in which patients go to healthcare workers and to doctors, to be helped and they actively want to receive help and therefore collaborate with, with professionals. In, in their case, it is a constant battle and there is this constant game of uh, mutually deceiving one another. Um, and, and that is often experienced as, as something very unpleasant and very hard uh, for professionals. So it's not like physical violence in most cases, but... Uh, it is something that makes their their work really really hard. Um, yeah. I guess this is a very important point to see, like how uh, anthropologists uh, have to treat the situation, because care receivers normally are seen as like uh, people who are seeking help, thereby if they are not like trick tricksters or the rest of it. But it's very important to see like how uh, these like rules and transgressions shape their relationships and, and it's like, it's never devoid of violence and, and constant negotiation. And that's an important uh, aspect of like care. Uh, please. Uh, Carries, please. Thank you. Raise your hand. Um, build on that, and um, I, I touched on a little bit from um, um, Simon's question, but um, one of the things I think that I observed was um, when with people with learning disabilities in, in social care support settings, which is the, the focus of my um, um, my research, um, was how I suppose the moments where they um, try to engage staff in, in physical contact, so try to hug them or hold their hand or even sometimes maybe kind of grab them, um, you could see as maybe minor, you know, that some staff might might feel, might have felt kind of violated by that, that their um, personal space was being violated. Um, but from the perspective of um, the people, with people with learning disabilities, I think it was also kind of an indication in, in some situations of, of um, uh, kind of being so deprived um, of those those kind of emotional connections with other people that any moment that they saw they could transgress those boundaries, they took that opportunity to do so just to feel that connection with somebody else. Um, and there, there, were, there was probably some level of awareness and um, people have varying levels of, of disability um, who I worked with uh, but there, was, there was, would have been some level of awareness, I'm sure, on their part that that, that um, those invitations or, or their requests or, or their demands weren't weren't being um, happily accepted. But it was it was still kind of a, such a strong need on their part to feel these things, to feel this connection that they just did it anyway. And um, I suppose part of what I'm interested in is 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 that also an indication of kind of um, how these rules are not really working for them they have to transgress these boundaries in these potentially and actually violent ways that that have may have a negative impact on staff um so i don't know if that's of interest to anyone <laughs> so great uh i think sultana's hand is up 
Yeah, I was. Uh, I wanted also to expand a little bit on uh, Tatiana's uh, later remark, like reflections about uh, uh, rules transgression and how, in order to transgress something, boundaries needs to need to be constructed in the first place, and that we rather should shift our perspective from the reactions. And uh, at least for my case, uh, like this, uh, in, in, in terms of young women's lives and marriage and this idea of uh, chastity and morality and so on. Uh, so if we, there is um, like a, the way how this rule is actually all the time brought up is, uh, for example, by um, the first reaction and comment of my research assistant who directly assumed ah, she was not the virgin, this is why it happened and so on. So those uh, rules are actually enacted and uh, constructed uh, through these courses uh, in the society. So it's um, in the, um, during my research, um, I also found it uh, like for me, um, the rules are, were always uh, very clear. Uh, on the one hand, because uh, of the way how people do they like talk about it, how what they expect, but on the other hand, there is uh, constantly this boundary work, um, as in the case of Adiba, who tries to somehow keep her morality, her keep her uh, respectful uh, appearance uh, to to the outer. Uh, to the public, so there is uh, on the one hand there is um, like through these courses rules are all the time reconstructed and somehow brought up, and this is why this the rules are also stay very still. And um, on the other hand, of uh, Tatiana also mentioned uh, that we maybe should shift uh, our attention to the reaction of to the rules of transgression, and at least in this case of Adiba, the, the family just. Uh, well, I, I haven't I haven't been there just right after and uh, after she divorced, but the family accepted this. Well, this is well, how it happened, uh, and I once also overheard uh, um, a grandmother mentioning, "Well, you decided not to stay, so well, we did it. We decided you should marry, but then you decided you should, will not stay, so you just go on." And um, yeah. I leave it like that. <laughs> so, thanks, thanks for the comments. And I guess it's very important to see. So this uh, draws our attention to what Tatiana said, like how we see the rules and transgressions from the perspective of the actors themselves and how they bend it. So it's not like there are rules necessarily there and, and they are subject to change, of course. And that's like the role of like ethnographers to understand how like dynamic the whole situation is, uh, especially in kinship uh, situations uh, where it's like the uh, like the boundaries are constantly uh, transgressed and traversed. Um, so um, we still have some minutes, and it's like we still have time for any final remarks. Um, if not, I would just uh, say a few words and then Marketa, please. Yeah, I can also respond. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, for reading the paper and for your comments. Um, and yes, like one of the points that you made, made was that it's kind of, I need to be clear of what tension is it that what where is the tension that I'm trying to draw attention to? And um, yeah, I think that is a very good point, and it is um, sort of something that I considered, but I haven't really thought it through properly when I was like writing the paper. Um, I mean, for me, there was definitely a tension, but like for at least for some of the converts, for like this guy Pavel, there was a tension between his kind of obligation to act as a pastor to provide this pastoral care to others and also kind of his obligation to his wife who could get seriously ill if she got infected with the virus. Um, so there is definitely this kind of tension even for some of the converts between obligations to the church uh, because the church has like its own set of rules that they, you know, they are expected to 
follow if as long if they want to remain part of the church and if they want to retain their position as for example a pastor and this obligation to like this private like their private um, family life but also there was kind of attention for me because i felt um like I felt obliged to say something because I knew they were exposing themselves or they were creating situations where they could get exposed to the virus. But uh, yeah, that was a tension that I actually haven't kind of resolved. And I, I did consider writing about it in like the paper as this kind of ethical considerations that I had that um, whether like I should be more clear or whether, I don't know, what is my role in this situation that... Um, Obviously, like, I'd, you know, because I've known these people for a long time as we kind of get to know our interlocutors. So I did kind of felt like sort of I care for them. I didn't want them to get infected. But on the other hand, I can't make decisions for them. Um, yeah, so just to kind of conclude, uh, thank you for pointing this out. That it's something that I need to consider more in the paper. And I think there are multiple tensions in, like, all these situations that we describe because people have different obligations and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marketa. I see uh, Iona's uh, um, hand is raised. Please, Iona. Yeah, I will attempt to give a short answer to the first question. Um, although my work there as a facilitator was with people who were not designed as dependent or, well, they were potentially made dependent through, through um, care provision and extended bordering, but they were not in a medical context. However, um, in the workshops, I was supposed to stay out of the cycle to allow empowerment within the team. So I had a, this constant tension between how much I would participate um, and how much I would follow up on personal needs of care because I had their stories and some people had lost their entire family, so some of the, the minors were unaccompanied. And it was clear that the workshop space was giving them some, some space of reassurance and collective expression and empowerment, but there was much more need for care that was not met by the general framework. And I started transgressing that therapeutic boundary, let's say, very slowly and very carefully. And at some points I was heavily challenged because um, the support that I received by the humanitarian organizations was very minimal. The job was really demanding and I was getting extremely tired. So my responses to how people created havoc and, and there was like sound bombs and a mess. And uh, sometimes I just, although we had made collective rules at the beginning that the, they were not respected. so transgressing, let's say, the balance of, of the workshops, um, I caught myself being increasingly more irritated. And at the end, I even told the person to shut up. And then obviously, I felt really bad about that because that was another boundary that was transgressed. And the way I decided to, to relate to that was to publicly um, apologize to that person in front of the entire group and I think that acknowledging him as a person that matters and I'm, I'm picking that from another paper was very good for him and for the team um, his behavior changed completely and also the other team members that ended up in fights found ways to resolve them through this mutual acceptance and, and taking responsibility for their actions so for me, that was one way of resolving that. So acknowledging that boundaries are being transgressed from both sides, but at least taking responsibility from my side, which enabled others to do so equally. And I mentioned myself because I had a position of authority within the group, being um, the workshop facilitator. In terms of transgressions and, and kind of using that term, which inevitably... Um, recognize the situations and boundaries that might be there, might not be there, and how much does that make them fixed? I, in the Greek context, I think that maybe it is a good way of seeing how people are um, 
boundaries beyond the borders themselves um, as biopolitical um, subjects, precisely because a lot of these acts of care were not illegal, but have started becoming increasingly illegalized because of these extended boundaries and, and borders, um, material and immaterial. So I think possibly transgression is a good way of seeing how borders operate beyond just the physical. And I think that these kind of, the legalization basically of, of, of caring for the other as the self, um, which obviously had the ripple effect in society and people did step back, um, also allowed a big space for um, extreme right reactions because at least in the Greek context, people are very active and, and kind of shape um, and enact their understandings of, of good and bad um, by, by taking part in, in social um, actions collectively or individually. And in the island of Lesbos, now we've ended up with um, concerned citizens, as they're often called, but uh, most of them belong to extreme right organizations enforcing uh, pushbacks themselves. So going to the beach and pushing people back and shouting at them and saying, you know, I don't care that you're a pregnant woman. You know, I didn't make you pregnant, so go back. And in that sense, I think what starts becoming normalized as boundaries and transgressions of these boundaries then also shift um, political and social understandings of situations. And in that sense, maybe the transgression there could be useful to be maintained as a, an analytical framework. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, insights. And so we've got like less than 10 minutes. I know that uh, it's Saturday and it's kind of, you might have uh, got tired. And so, Sorry, uh, that, uh, uh, please, let's see. From, yes, please. From Julia. Uh, I don't know. Do you want me to read or you want to? Yeah. Suggested. It's the same. You can, yeah, you can go on. <laughs> okay, so uh, Julia. No, but that's a bit weird. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, I can, I can do it. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because I got <laughs> to the end at 2.30, so I just thought to write it because, you know, we didn't have time. So, no, I was just wondering, actually, building on uh, Marketa, Marketa's comment um, and, and Tatiana's concluding um, thoughts, whether um, it might be helpful also to shift the focus not just to the reactions of um, acts of transgressions of rules but also to the to what is the, to what precedes this transgressions of rules and the rules themselves so the the kind of boundary, boundary work that uh, that precedes the transgression and and that otherwise risks being being overlooked um, and what this boundary work tells us about uh, what is relevant in a specific in a specific context and uh, whether it yeah uh, framing care as a kind of boundary work and uh, as crossing boundaries and what kind of boundaries you know between the internal and the external between different groups of people uh, if, if that could be helpful um, to illuminate other things that uh, might get lost um, otherwise and yeah here I was thinking specifically um, for example um, in my case the the fact that the family cares is put aside during treatment, during residential treatment, uh, comes from a previous context in which, because the state doesn't really give much funding to public healthcare facilities and many patients struggle to have access to care, the family is actually left alone and have, they have to care for their sick children in ways that go well beyond their possibilities. And when they finally, some of them, manage to access care, they're, they're suddenly told, okay, you have to step back. And it, so th this boundary work kind of comes in a context where what was there before is really important. Um, so I guess that, you know, this 
will apply to many other instances as well. And it will be really interesting to, to look at that, I think. Yes, and, and, and I was thinking perhaps we can, uh, what we didn't address in the, in the panel was like how care uh, contributes to marginalization. So the, this act of boundary making and creation of categories, and this is something that we may uh, get a chance later to address. So Emily, please. You. Yeah, thanks. I, I was just going to build on that, but perhaps it's, it's repeating, Ahmed, what, what you've just said and um, expanding Julia's comment, which is that I think um, to extend it further, it's also really interesting to think about how those categories are made in the first place, how, standardized, how standards are created, how regulations are created and what is negotiated and what assumptions and politics are then imbued into those. Um, just because in the conversations that I've been having here around the creation of standards around water quality, um, there, there is a lot of productive work that goes into it and that um, infuses what then emerges as those rules that are then broken or where that boundary work takes place um, and where the assumptions of what might be transgressed is then fixed. Um, so that's just to, to kind of to expand on, on those comments, um, uh, drawing on, on the particular case here where the creation of the standards is, is an important part of um, the broader politics and what's then produced as a result of them. Cool. Uh, so um, you only have, uh, so any final comments because we are like very, like we have very limited time. So any, any final, final. So if not, I, I uh, just wanted to thank you all for the, uh, for sharing your thoughts, for sharing your papers. It's been a long journey from the drafting the panel to, uh, to talking to Tatiana and in Paris and, 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 and the fact that she kindly accepted to join us to today. So it's, it's been a long, long journey. But we are determined to continue this. And this is um, because we found it quite interesting and exciting to further this uh, uh, conversation. And, and we would like to have like, a, there are, that can take like different forms. One thing is just like to have a follow-up workshop. Um, uh, and in between, we would ask you to develop your papers. Hopefully we would have this like in Berlin. If not, the, a different shape is like we would, uh, because uh, Leticia and I prepared an introduction and, and we are thinking of either a special issue or something else, but this is something to be decided. This is, there is nothing certain now. Uh, uh, and we would, we would be in contact with you. If you like to know, uh, if you get like the comments in written form, please let us know. Uh, and, and please stay in touch. We will, uh, we will definitely contact you. Uh, if the, it's a special issue, we, uh, we, we are afraid that we have to be selective. If, if it's, it's the edited volume, we, we can be uh, the restriction. We are not as restricted, but we will see how it goes. And, uh, and we are very happy to have Tatiana uh, with us and, and, and she will support us. And that's quite exciting and, and very important for us. Uh, so Letizia, uh, so I, I just like pass the baton to Letizia. Oh, well, I guess you, you've already said all that needed to be said. I just um, second is like round of thanks to uh, the presenters and Tatiana will definitely get in touch with, with you, the presenters and see what we can, how we can move this conversation further. So thank you very much again. Um, have a good weekend. Okay, it's Saturday and a panel on Saturday is a bit of a pain probably. So enjoy the rest of the day. And, 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 the, and the summer holiday. And this is the beginning holiday. of summer holiday. Yes. So Go stay on. healthy and stay well. see you soon. Of this year's and bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 bye.